Hello, everybody. I'm Bob Couture, host of Where the Twain Meet. Welcome to our series of chats and interviews that I hope will shed new light on the subject of dispute resolution, areas where our human competitive and cooperative impulses, the core elements of conflict, are melded together into alloys of behavior that may not always prove predictable. We'll look in places where you'd expect the subject to be examined, but also perhaps where you might not. Our agreements, truces, deals, legal judgments, alliances, bonds of love, victories, losses, even works of art, created by some magical alchemy? Or are there real axioms, proven methods, which guide us through the churn of conflict to meaningful resolution. I think about Rodney King's simple plea during the 1992 Los Angeles protest riots. Can we all get along? Can we all get along? That wasn't just a question. It was a proposition too. Is that proposition impossible to achieve or even ridiculous to seriously consider? Let's talk with folks who may tell us something that we don't know, and let's try to find more answers. Of course, like many good things in life, some of the remedies are probably in plain sight. But on this show, we'll do our best to probe ideas simple and complex and not look the other way. Jerome Harris is an acclaimed jazz guitar and bass player. He is based in New York and travels widely performing all over the world. Jerome performed with Sonny Rollins for 13 years and has shared the stage with more great musicians than I can mention. He is a member of the Musician Workers Alliance, whose shared purpose is to empower music workers by engaging in collective action to create a community where music is valued financially and culturally and the dignity of their work is protected. His scholarly interests have led to an essay, Jazz on the Global Stage, published in the anthology, The African Diaspora, A Musical Perspective. We went to the New England Conservatory together and played in Gunther Schuller's New England Ragtime Ensemble for decades. He is a man of great humor and spirit, with much to say about navigating a world of tonal consonance and dissonance. I'm pleased to introduce him to you and hope you enjoy our discussion today about Where the Twain Meet. Jerome Harris, welcome to the show. So good to see you again. It's hard to believe that it's already been a year uh, since we met up at the Bach Dancing and Dynamite Society in Madison, Wisconsin, and played all those concerts and rehearsals with our old band, the New England Ragtime Ensemble. That was fun. The reunion was fun, and just working with you and our colleagues was great, but also I'll always remember those chats and the hang we had basically after all those concerts. It's not easy making a living as a musician, but there are some advantages. And one of them is how many people could say they got a standing ovation when they were done with work. The energy of the group too after a concert and all the discussions we had was memorable. I particularly enjoyed the discussions that I had with you, I realized that much of what we talked about relates to the idea of resolution. Music itself is a kind of mediation of cultures and history and even performance practices. You touch on so many places in music and around music. I'm excited to have a conversation with you about your thoughts. One of the places I think would be interesting to talk about would be the Music Workers Alliance, that organization that you're part of in New York. Tell me about that a little bit. Why the Alliance and what you guys are up to? Well, first of all, hi, Bob. It's great, great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me to take part in this podcast. Music Workers Alliance has been in existence for about four years. It started in 2019. I didn't find out about it until uh, spring of 2020, you know, as the pandemic had rolled in to our lives and it's a volunteer musician founded run and led and conceived advocacy organizing and activism group 
the guitarist Mark Rebo was one of the co-founders and the organization really grew out of work that he's been doing for a number of years, Local 802 of the American Federation of Musicians of the New York City local, working with them in parallel with them and to a certain extent outside of them, trying to, to better address issues that the, what we call the indie musician sector have encountered. And there are some challenges, problems that the AFFM hasn't really addressed very effectively in our observation over years. Most of our members are in the New York City metropolitan area, although we have members all across the country, actually, and we want to build our membership outside of the New York region. But we work on local, state, and federal policy initiatives, trying to give some information to electeds about what we musicians encounter, how our work lives are structured, and challenges that we face. And we hope to build our power to address some of the more corporate realm challenges that we face. What would those challenges be? Someone says, well, geez, those folks play music are having a lot of fun, and I hear they get paid something for it, and it looks like a pretty good scene to me. Well, a number of challenges were revealed by the pandemic. Uh, there were things that long predate that health crisis, but everything from the need to have some kind of unemployment benefits for the gig economy worker sector. And of course, musicians are the original gig workers. You know, that's where the term comes from, our work being called gigs. So we worked in coalition with a number of other performing arts groups to try to get the pandemic unemployment benefits instituted and extended. We worked to try to get some initiatives at the local New York City level um, to try to get some things through the city council to make it easier for musicians who were completely unemployed during the pandemic to be able to earn money in COVID safe ways, outdoor performing. There were issues about cities permitting regulations that were impeding the ability of people to charge fees to audiences for performing and to try to get what they call sound device permits, you know, to allow amplification in certain places in the city. We offered some written testimony to one of the federal Senate subcommittee dealing with intellectual property rights around reforming aspects of the copyright laws to try to address problems with online platforms hosting recordings that infringe on the rights of the owners because we really feel that tanks the ability to set for people for labels and for independent self-produced artists to sell their recording. People are not going to buy stuff that they can get for free. The platforms are supposed to take down content that's been put up there that infringes on copyright, but they actually make it quite difficult for people, for individuals and small labels to have that stuff taken off of the platforms. And so we've been trying to address that issue. There's just some examples of what we've been working on over the past four years. Do you find when you're out there talking to these various agents, government, et cetera, it's difficult to explain what you do in terms of work? In other words, do they look at artists as workers? I'll say generally not. There's a real lack of understanding that 
I have encountered and that we in MWA have encountered among legislators and other government policy makers and certainly in the general public. You know, one reason that, you know, Mark Rebo called the organization, named it Music Workers Alliance, is to spotlight the reality that musicians are workers. And I suppose this may be an unfortunate aspect of English language usage that we say that we play instruments and we play music and somehow play is seen as opposite of work. The effort to get to performance venues, the activity of learning and maintaining your skills on your instrument of creating, composing, arranging, studying, learning pieces that we perform. I mean, you could even extend this to the work that DJs do, knowing what the vast body of recordings that they're going to choose from to put together a set. This is all physical, intellectual, sometimes even emotional work. And work deserves compensation and the people who do this work need it in order to put food on the table and keep a roof over our heads. And when you get into the particulars of the work where policy may be relevant, how an artist gets paid if they are the lead artist in a recording situation, if it's with a label, who pays them, what the rates are, if they're side people in a recording session, who pays them, what the pay rates are, what contracts, if any, are filed, if they are the composer and a composition is recorded and broadcast on streaming service or on radio, you know, again, who pays them, what the rates of compensation are, what their rights are. A lot of this stuff is really not generally understood. It's certainly not understood by much of the public. I mean, I, I've been in meetings with New York City Council, people's staffers. I was once in a meeting when Nancy Pelosi was the Speaker of the House with one of her arts policy staffers. And it was quite surprising what they don't know about what music workers do. Jerome, one piece of what you were talking about to focus even further inside the musician's game, as it were, a lot of musicians would not consider DJs as part of their alliance if they were to have a workers' alliance because there was a time when there was a perception that DJs were actually taking work away from bands and ceremonial kind of work, maybe even clubs. Mm -hmm. I've observed that. I remember some years ago I was playing in a group at a summer poolside party and we were alternating sets with the DJ. And at one point while we were on a break and the DJ was spinning, the host came up to him with an iPad and said, hey, just play this playlists. That was interesting, just observing, oh, okay, DJs have cut into live musician you know, work, but now as the technology advances, maybe the DJ is going to be reduced to just the person who comes and sets up the sound system. <laughs> How did the Alliance decide to be in league with DJs? This was a real concept level decision. We acknowledge that interests of DJs are not exactly the same as the interests of recording musicians or live performing musicians. But the fact that 
DJs are out here making money, some at the uh, pointy end of the pyramid of that profession, playing big resorts out in Ibiza or stadiums, making, I don't know, six figures a night income. This is a segment of the music culture and the music business. And we felt that trying to include them and to hear from them and to try to represent some of their interests, if possible, was potentially a more fruitful way to advance the interests of all musicians and music workers. I mean, we also tr include recording engineers and front of house mix engineers, for instance. And again, the way that their work is structured is not identical to the way work is structured, but there are some common interests if we can find them and articulate them. And Mark Rebo in particular felt that the musician unions, I guess you could say antagonistic, oppositional stance towards DJs was not really helping the effort to address the issues that we performers have. I'll say personally that MWA has had some difficulty reaching and bringing in DJs and retaining them in the organization. So this is something that we continue to struggle with. But we do believe in remaining open to them as members and trying to hear from them to find commonality where we can and try to move forward once we find those commonalities. Would you say that during the time of your career, attitudes in society have changed about intellectual property? Yes, I'm thinking about what I've observed over my time. I graduated from New England Conservatorio in 77, certainly playing and observing the music world as, as a listener and student before that and have been quite involved since then. This is a complicated question. Thinking of music as intellectual property, that awareness and perspective has grown in the society over time. But when digitization entered the scene and the shift from analog recording technology and delivery of music, the shift from LPs and 45s to and cassettes and eight track cartridges, all of that stuff. The shift from all of that to CDs and then people being able to rip the audio files from the CDs and the advent of MP3 technology, you know, data compression, making the files small enough to be able to effectively email around that was a real fundamental foundational shift. And so music recordings became clearly in the same class as software, as digitized text, TXT files and Word files and all of that with the rise of the World Wide Web oh, you're looking at some website, oh, you can copy and paste this text and dump it into some other software or do whatever you want to do with it, send it someplace. All of that was a lot more cumbersome pre-digitization of media. So seeing music, and, and specifically music recording, as media in the same way that all these other types are, made it more challenging to enforce the rights of the creators and owners of 
that media because stuff could be copied without destroying the original material, original source, and could be copied literally endlessly. There's a very interesting book about the music example of this by a, a journalist named Stephen Witt. The title, I forget it exactly, but something like How Music Became Free or How Music Got Free. He's a very good writer and really portrays all of this specifically in the realm of music recording and what it did for and against the interests of people who are trying to make music, sell music, be able to keep body and soul together by making money from their work, our work as musicians. And the recording industry's role in this, their difficulty figuring out how to respond to the shifting waves of technology and the businesses that were arguably leeching value from them. And it's a very interesting period that we've been living through. And in a way, we're still trying to catch up with these sorts of evolutionary technological changes. And I think we're on the cusp of, of another one, frankly. Artificial intelligence is the flavor of the, the moment in the media, but one real concern that I and a number of people, including folks in Music Workers Alliance have, is the use of generative AI technology to, I hesitate to say create music. I have been tending to use the word assemble music. I'm kind of following the lead of the writer Michael Pollan here, talking about food-like substances, edible food-like substances that the hyper-processed foods are. There's a lot of technology out here, both tools and research into assembling music automatically through the use of trained software. This is this artificial intelligence going in and, you know, you put a bunch of Johann Sebastian Bach into it. It analyzes the patterns of melodies and rhythms and harmonies and such, and it can spit out stuff that sounds like Bach or sounds like Hank Williams or sounds like Little Nas X or sounds like rogs from Indian classical music. We'll see where all of that goes in terms of the intellectual property rights of the owners of the music that was used to train these systems, to create these systems, the rights of music creators who maybe use these systems as tools. Does the software made by OpenAI need to get a cut of the profits from using some composition in some film where the composer maybe used some of those tools to help stimulate some ideas. This is very much what the Writers Guild of America is trying to address in the strike that is on right now. You know, the use of generative AI in creating scripts. Some studio uses this technology to crank out some script and then gives it to a writer, say, well, could you make this more palatable? And the writers are saying, oh, wait a doggone minute here. You're both cutting out the number of humans needed to create this stuff and then you're making the humans clean up what the software spit out. That ain't right. <laughs> you know. So we in Music Workers Alliance are just starting to really try to track this stuff carefully and develop some positions. But the intellectual property rights of music makers is a complicated 
area. Have you ever found yourself in a dispute with a venue owner or a promoter or a record label? I've been perhaps fortunate in that I haven't personally been in that many disputes. I think it's largely because I work almost entirely as a side person. I have been in a few disputes here and there. I did a recording as a band leader back in the 1980s during the transition from LPs to CDs. And in my contract, there was a CD rate listed, but the company never issued CDs. And so we had a dispute about that, which never really got resolved to my satisfaction. With band leaders, I've been quite fortunate to have worked mainly with honorable people. And occasionally, if there's some misunderstanding or miscommunication about something, we've been able to work them out. So as a side person, you're certainly present to the kinds of dynamics that occur in bands and on the set. Do you find that musicians resolve disputes differently than folks outside our industry? You know, it's a little bit hard for me to definitively answer that question because my direct experience outside of our industry has been pretty limited. What I hear from my wife, who is in a different industry, and from friends. I'll preface this by saying that I work primarily in jazz and jazz-related, jazz-adjacent genres. And I'm not an orchestral player. I've only had one experience playing in a Broadway pit. So my sector of the music profession is pretty informal. Most of my agreements between me and band leaders has been on a phone call, handshake, verbal basis, very few written agreements drafted and signed. So I think the informality of my world is certainly quite different from many other professions. Of course, I've done some teaching uh, at the university level as an adjunct, and so there were signed contracts there. The informality can lead to some lack of clarity sometimes. People vary. Some folks are very specific. Hey, here's a project. I'd love to have you on it. I can pay you $250 for this amount of work, and they're very specific about what the work is, be it recording or performing or whatever. And the terms are clear. And I can say, okay, if the work isn't confirmed, I can put it down as tentative. I will let you know, or please let me know, say six weeks beforehand, if this is confirmed or not, because if it's not and some other offer comes in on that date, I might really need to take it. There can be that kind of clarity. Then there's other people who are not nearly so specific and clear, and they're not that specific about how much work they really want you to do, You know how much time is it likely to take. Someone sends some written music and it's really scrawled such that it's hard to read and okay am I going to take the time to crank out just for myself out of self-protection more legible chart for myself I'm laughing because I'm remembering some specific instances <laughs> am I going to ask for more money because this has gotten more involved so in those ways I think the informality and having to deal with foibles of particular individuals sometimes in these less formal situations 
that can be different from how a lot of other professions work. How do you approach resolving creative disagreements that arise during collaborative music project? Let's say you don't like the tempo of a tune or you don't like the groove. Something's not sitting right. I've been fortunate in that I've often been able to make suggestions. And if the leader doesn't agree with my suggestion, then, you know, my role is to do what I'm asked to do by the leader. You know, even though if I feel like this tune would sound better, a little bit quicker or whatever, I may make the suggestion you know, if they take it, great. And if they don't, great. I'll try to make things work the best that I can. And that's generally not a problem. I'm often in situations where it's about collaboration and it's about the input of all of the band members, their input being heard and considered. That can be a big part of the jazz dynamic. You know, there's sometimes there are other situations where I don't feel that it's my role as a side person to come from a my way or the highway place. And so I don't do that. There have been the few cases where I felt that I wasn't the right or the best person musically in terms of my skills and my aesthetic habits and whatever. I may not be the best person for a particular project and I'll say so if that comes up you know I can do the slapping and popping thing on bass guitar but there are some people who do that all day every day much better than me and so if this tune needs Marcus Miller I think you ought to call Marcus Miller or someone more like him than I am. That has occasionally come up. It's like, why'd you call me for this? I can give you some numbers of some folks who I think would be better for this. Do you notice a change in the way you're working with the group when you are the band leader? Oh, for sure. When I've been the leader, it's up to me to decide and communicate to everyone my vision of the project. And there are different ways to do that. The vision is manifested in the arranging that I do, and therefore in the, the charts that I make for people and the suggestions for how I want folks to approach them. And I try, because all my projects have been jazz projects where I've led, I try to think of, okay, who would be good? Who do I want to play with? Because I like how they tend to approach stuff. And if I can get them on the project, I will probably not have to say as much about what I am looking for. Because I know that those people are already in sync. Obviously, there's some communication about direction and even instruments, hey, I'd like you to play soprano sax on this rather than alto, even though I know you can do both, but let me try this. Or could you try this on this other instrument in the rehearsal to help me figure out what I want? So you're in that role as the band leader of asking people to do things more than being asked to do things. Do you have a strategy for getting the most from these people whose skills you're familiar with in the service of this vision that you're bringing to the project? Yeah, I would say that I try to seek consensus because having everyone feel their personality musically is represented. You know, it's a less conflictual way to work and people can give more of themselves if you're working that way. You know, I'm thinking of, okay, a drummer. If we're rehearsing the tune, I feel, oh, they're putting too much 
melody and not enough groove. You know, it's like too much variation. And someone might say, hey, would you chill the F out? <laughs> you know, but that's not what I would say. I would say, hey, this feels a little too edgy, too busy for me, for what I'm looking for here. Could you be like less dense here? You know, fewer ideas. I'd love you just to kind of just lay it down here. And then some other tune or some other section of the tune that, uh, yeah, here, give me more, open up more. Being diplomatic, I guess, in, in how you say what you want helps a lot. I know in our business, maybe more when we we're younger, but there are these moments when there can be humiliation involved in the kind of direction we get. Could you comment on what happens to a musician and their ability to contribute when they feel maybe more than humbled, but humiliated. You're avoiding that in your style, the diplomatic style. Yeah, yeah. I try to avoid that scenario both from my personality, but also having been the target of some humiliation, you know. And it can really make you feel like you're in a box. And some players will talk about, yeah, that guy, he put the handcuffs on me <laughs> here. In a genre where self-expression and even self-expression in how to interpret and manifest your playing as a side person, you know, okay, you're playing a bass guitar, I'm not the headliner. The bass tends to be in a supportive role, but in jazz, it also is a melodic manifesting supportive role. So you're not supposed to sound boring back there in the rhythm section. You know, there's moment to moment decisions to make about how active to be and how to be active. I've been in situations where the leader felt that I was too active. I guess it's my years of listening to and loving Ron Carter and Dave Holland and Scott LaFaro and Charlie Hayden and some really melodically interesting bassists. So I've been in some situations where my natural way of approaching some tune was too melodic, too much Anthony Jackson or something there, too much James Jamerson. So I was like, okay, I will cool it out. <laughs> I appreciate it if a band leader is not humiliating in how they ask for in that regard. Oh, okay, no, I got you. I see what, cool. I can have fun in a slightly smaller sandbox and and sometimes it's like oh actually listening to this oh i agree with you because there's some music where some particular tunes and some band leaders conceptions where no the bass should not be running around it's really about keeping a certain zone stable so that other elements of the music can dance around those. And there's just as much nobility in doing that as there is in running all over, jumping registers and putting little dissonances in. You know, yeah, all that can be cool. There's a place for that. But there's also places where that's pulling the ear more towards the bassist, and that's not really what the piece is about. Have you ever shared a deep musical relationship with a musician you don't like, person? Mm. I have to think about this. Hmm. Deep musical relationship. I'm thinking about one particular band leader who I worked with locally um, we never recorded but i worked with him pretty regularly for a number of years he passed he actually passed away a couple of years ago unfortunately and aspects of how he played 
and how he would sometimes treat other folks on the bandstand really bugged me. And for a while, I actually stopped taking his calls because I didn't feel like I knew him personally well enough to get into his business and say, hey, why'd you talk to the, that guitar player that way? That really seemed uncalled for. But I was disgruntled enough about that and about certain aspects of his playing that, man, I don't No, I'm not into this. So I just stopped taking his calls for several years. And I'm not the only musician who did that. I mean, I know other folks who said, man, I stopped working with that guy years ago. You know, are you kidding me? So some time passed and I don't really remember exactly why, but he called me and I don't remember why I said yes. Uh, and I started back working with him and I somehow I found that I was emotionally better able and more willing to tolerate aspects of him and playing his particular repertoire I could find yeah okay there's something that I'm I could use it would serve me in terms of my musical development to play more of this material even in this situation yes I'll work with him and I did he hadn't really mellowed that much maybe a little bit Perhaps I had arguably mellowed a little bit too. And I very much appreciated his doggedness and success in getting work. I'm a little bit, perhaps to a fault, I'm not so dogged in getting gigs for myself and negotiating what the fee is going to be and all of that probably one reason why I work more as a side person than as a band leader. But this guy, you know, he was a tenor saxophonist and there's so many of them around. If you're not a warrior trying to sniff out work, you may not work. And I really learned a bit from him in that regard. So, you know, I honor that. Do you recognize a person's personality separate from their music in the way they play. Yeah, I think I do. I'm thinking about all sorts of folks, all sorts of players that I know and have played with, and there aren't that many that come to mind whose personality is clearly in some way different from their musical personality. This is something that, that I hadn't really thought about. Perhaps this is something that's characteristic in the jazz world because it is so much, the ethos of jazz is very much self-expression. And so the personality, the offstage or non-music aspects of their non-musical personality tend to come out in some way in their music. There are some people who can surprise you in this, though. I'm thinking of, of my colleague Bill Frizzell as one example, who, if you get a chance to speak to him, you know, he tends to be rather slow speaker verbally and considered in what he says. Maybe you could say, arguably, he's not an aggressive speaker. But in the right musical context, he can roar. And that contrast, I mean, I'm thinking that, you know, he was in some project that John Zorn led for a number of years. This is a band called Naked City. And Bill would open the floodgates along with everybody else in, in the group and stuff would pour out and rock and distortion and abstract chaos, you know. But speaking to Bill, you might not think that he was capable of that, but he is. <laughs> you know, so people can surprise you. I'm thinking of another friend 
of mine, the drummer Firon Akla. He's been in a number of pretty open improv situations that call for power and density, but he can also be very delicate when the music calls for it. So people might not know that he's capable of that. All of that said, a lot of the musicians that I know who are thoughtful in non-musical realms are thoughtful. Their thoughtfulness comes out in their musical expression. And people who are not afraid to be angular and sometimes confrontational personally, that is a substantial part of their music. We musicians tend to come together from all kinds of different places. Do you find that musicians tend to transcend cultural and racial differences in a meaningful way? Or do they just stay in personal silos as others often do? There are many musicians that I know of and engaged with and in communities ethnic communities, genre communities, and such. But I think the fact that many of us travel and have to travel, I mean, not all musicians do travel much, but in my world, there's only so much work in the New York City metro area, you know, and, and you've got to even travel around this area, go out to New Jersey and Connecticut and Massachusetts and up to Vermont or down to D.C. But many of us in my scene also tour in Europe regularly and try to and to some degree travel in the U.S. And that travel experience and certainly having that experience over time. It's a cliche that travel broadens, but it's a true statement. You know, I think the fact that you have to sometimes you know, deal with people who have a different native language than you and live in a different culture. And in terms of class, I find myself using the term People talk about upper class and middle class and working class. And I feel that at least for some number of musicians, there's artist class, which is distinct because musicians have a training and experience that in its depth and rigor can rival people's training and experience in the medical profession and in law and such. We're often usually not earning as much money as folks in those professions. We are regularly meeting folks from a variety of income levels. And, you know, it's like you can find yourself going into the artist entrance at the Conservatorium, you know, in in Holland in Amsterdam one week, but then, you know, going through the service entrance in some function hall because they don't let musicians go through the, the lobby of the hotel in another week, and these ranges of experiences broaden how a lot of musicians think and act. Would you consider music itself the? Uh compositional tensions, the flow between consonances and dissonances uh, as a form of conflict resolution. Absolutely. Yeah. Tension and release is one of the fundamental and rich dynamic aspects of music. We in the West learn how chord progressions work. And we talk about your one and four, five, one, you know, the five, one cadence. I mean, cadences are resolutions. You know, some piece sets out some material and it's developed. And then, you know, when it comes back home, 
it resolves and that's an intellectual construct is somewhat abstract, but we have emotional associations to that resolving, you know, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Da, 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 da. And you leave that hanging there and everyone is, you know, knows that it's going to get, duh, you know, the tonic and then, ha, ah, you know, and how a piece creates tension. There's a set of variations on God Save the King because of when it was written, you know, that Beethoven wrote. I've got this recording as one of those works without an opus number. And the play of variation, when one of the variations starts out in a minor key, instead of major. It's like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> you know, that's a type of tension, you know, because we all have heard that melody in major for all of our lives. So it's like, oh, there's something similar in the melody and in the harmony, but there's something different. And, you know, the lay listener, well, a lot of people may know, you know, maybe hear that, oh, that's gone into a minor key. Many people probably can't label how that variation works verbally, but they certainly hear it and feel it because they've got this lifetime of having heard the tune harmonized in one particular way. And here it is, it's clearly a related melody is only you know, there's a minor third there instead of the major but you know, oh that's fresh so yes setting up conflict tensions for sure and then playing with the listeners expectations that's a huge part of music and so i think it is a type of conflict resolution is absolutely at play so what is it about music that creates such a straight line to the emotions. Music, at least how I think about it, is very much a multi-dimensional experience. It's very somatic. When we play instruments, you're applying your body to breath, to air, and to brass, and to steel into wood, you know, you're making these things vibrate in, in various ways. And, you know, that the dimension of high pitches and low pitches are associated with our physical experience. Different muscles are stretched or whatever they're being stretched. But then down there and low, you know, you know, and so we can intuitively respond to sounds and their somatic relationship to bodily experience. Walking down the street and you're keeping a relatively steady tempo, but then you come to a corner and you stop and then start up again. You know, the regularity of tempo and then the change of tempo and meter where, you know, okay, if you're alternating your feet, but then you notice one, two, three, and then one, two, three, you know, the limb that's on one changes, you know, because you've got two limbs, but you're grouping the, um, the steps in a three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, you know, it's a, and you get into a wall. So there's that whole somatic realm and there's the abstract, arguably abstract pursuit of design of musical elements where we've got pattern play of rhythms and pitches and timbres and loudness versus soft quietness and dense areas where there's a lot of sound, a lot of different sounds and or less dense area of a solo flute or something. And what a composer does with all of these elements, 
like I said, it can be thought of as somewhat abstract pattern play sometimes. But then again, of course, we all have emotional associations and those are very much modulated through our listening cultures. What you have grown up hearing, singing, playing, seeing other people play and sing and music used for helping people to relax or helping people to become stimulated. People talk about, you know, what they want to hear before they go out of the house to go to work on Monday morning. But then on the weekend, they're using music differently. Music used for celebration situations or for honoring people. Fanfares, the noble person is coming down the road for some ceremony or the playing of taps when a service person is being laid to rest. You know, we have associations to music that make the design elements not abstract for listeners. Composers use it, hopefully skillfully. I'm thinking of fanfares. You know, John Williams in in film, of course, we have these associations that we hear. Some of these are coming to mind because I just heard a radio story about John Williams and pointing out Jaws. Okay, here the shark is going to be circling under the legs of the swimmer. We learn all of these things. I mean, this is all part of our culture. And of course, I'm just bringing up Western examples. There are all kinds, you know, universes of non-Western examples that function the same way, you know, within those different cultural contexts. I want to talk a little bit more about being a musician again and your experience here in the United States as a Black musician. As a Black musician, having performed for decades in the U.S., and abroad, have you encountered challenges related to race? How do you approach conflicts of this nature? I'm thinking about this. I'm going to take a moment even more to think about it before I speak. My experiences around race that have been challenging, I find them perhaps more interesting than difficult. Periodically, I mean, fairly often, um, I have found myself to be the only person of African descent, you know, the only African American in a band, and sometimes in an audience. Partially, I suppose, because my tastes are broad and they include genres that are not thought of as African-American. And I suppose maybe partially because I try to, and I think I feel that I generally succeed in approaching situations with openness, even when I'm uncomfortable about how I'm being treated or what's going on, I tend to not jump to a confrontational or oppositional place. I mean, I will certainly protect myself and my interests, but it's not a habit for me if I find like my emotion is triggered to go to a, immediately anyway, to go to a confrontational place for good or for ill. That's, you know, how I tend to, to be. For the last number, good, God, got to be over 10 years now, playing in several projects led by the clarinetist David Krakauer, who is a classical player. You know, he's guest soloist with orchestras and such, and a leading musician in the modern world of klezmer music, music that came out of the Eastern European Jewish 
communities, countries, regions, and, you know, has been in the U.S. for a long, long time. And I've often been the only black person in some of his bands. And we've played in a lot of Jewish music settings in temples and synagogues and in Jewish music festivals. You know, we don't only play in those sorts of situations, but we've done a lot of that. Um, actually, we're going to be next month at Yidstock, which is a little festival that happens up at the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts. And that's not been at all challenging to me. I think it has been novel for some audiences to see black folks playing klezmer. It's not so common, though I remember decades ago seeing the Klezmer Conservatory Band, which was a group that was formed by Hankus Netsky at New England Conservatory, and for a while, that group's clarinetist was Don Byron, who is African-American, a colleague of mine. And I remember, I think it might have been my first time actually seeing that group play. It was in Boston, I think at a temple or a, some kind of Jewish community center. And I'm pretty sure I was the only black person in the audience and Don was the only black person in the group. I think maybe we didn't know each other at all at that point. He started at NEC a couple of years after I did. We didn't really overlap much. But he saw me in the audience during the break, and it was almost like he levitated himself <laughs> over the crowd to come and say hi. Uh, he was so glad to see another brother in, in the space. So that can happen. Um, sometimes there's been some type casting or stereotyping that people can do. I haven't experienced it so much in musical situations. It's just just in life, in in general, and in music work situations are just part of life. So occasionally playing at some uber wealthy person's estate, uh, for lack of a better term, up in, in Greenwich, Connecticut, and someone in the crowd doesn't know that I'm in the band. They think I'm one of the service people. And maybe to them, if you're the musician, you are a service person. <laughs> that has happened a number of times. Just roll with people's foibles. People don't necessarily assume seeing me that I've gone to Newland Conservatory or to Harvard College. I'm happy to enlighten them if some situation comes up where that's appropriate. How is it different performing jazz in Europe compared to the United States? Ooh, wow. Okay, this might be gradually changing, but what I have observed over the decades is that playing particularly in the wealthy Western European countries, but even in Poland and Czech Republic and Hungary and Ukraine. Jazz, I think, is viewed in general a bit differently in those countries than it is in the U.S. It's viewed as a fine art, not necessarily viewed in the same way as European classical music is viewed in Europe, but it is definitely respected. I think more of the population, certainly more of the music active population in Europe, they seem to know more. I think they've heard a wider variety of jazz than the average music fan in the U.S. I attribute that to the different media environment, the broadcast media environment in Europe, which for decades, the, you know, 
there is commercial radio and television in all of these countries, but there also are national networks. Germany has a national radio and TV network, Netherlands, Italy, Austria, Switzerland, France, Spain, all these countries have national broadcasting. And those outlets tend to follow more of a curatorial model. You know, they're not commercial. I mean, I'm sure they want to have a substantial audience, of course, but they're not chasing advertisers doggedly and having to make programming decisions based on attracting the largest number of listeners or viewers so that they can keep their ad rates up. And gosh, it's been dozens of times, you know, you play some gig in Europe, come back to the hotel room, happen to flip on the TV before I go to sleep, and they'll be broadcasting a festival, jazz festival, older ones or current festival. Oh, there's Brad Meldow playing a concert someplace recently. And on the radio, a lot of times the jazz broadcasts will mix current artists. They'll have Diane Reeves or Samara Joy or Christian McBride, some current artists. And then they'll play some Harry Sweet's Edison track or some stuff from the 50s or from the 60s or from the 70s. They'll mix it up and contextualize the current artist that they're presenting. That kind of broad spectrum jazz programming is hard to find in the U.S. I mean, there are no commercial jazz broadcasting outlets on radio anymore. That died decades ago here. So it's really just public radio and college stations. And I don't have a good fix on how that has changed and how that may have affected things in Europe versus in the U.S. in terms of informed jazz audiences. I would love to read some reportage and studies about that, and I need to kind of ask people when I tour, you know, how that's been shifting things, or if it has been shifting things. How does an informed a jazz audience respond? Audiences in different countries and different contexts can respond differently, but certainly this is hard to say with authority. It's just, you know, personal observation, but I feel that there can be something different in the energy in a room or in a hall in terms of how people are listening and how they respond to what they're hearing, if they respond verbally or clapping-wise or whatever. There's something, for lack of a better term, the energy in the space. You can tell, you know, if someone plays something in their soloing that is subtle, and you can see people sometimes, what they do physically, respond, that you can tell that they're with you. And certainly, I'm thinking about sometimes playing with Sonny Rollins, who, among other things, could be masterful in his use of quotes of songs. And he'll throw some quote of something in and do it in a particularly artful way. You can kind of see the light bulbs go off in the crowd. <laughs> Informed listeners can respond in that way sometimes. How about Africa? Do audiences find an intrinsic connection to jazz that Europeans might not experience? Well, I've been to countries in Africa a few times, almost all, on 
U.S. State Department sponsored and organized tours. So they used to call this program the Jazz Ambassadors Program. They've, they've changed the program now to Egypt and Sudan, Kenya, Malawi, Togo, Liberia, Ivory Coast, once to Cape Town, South Africa. Those concerts were not like a big, big venue concerts. And sometimes it would be for somewhat select or self-selected audiences, people who were interested in jazz. I guess I would say the audiences could certainly tell that this was African diasporic music. And some people had heard jazz before. You know, it's like hearing something that a cousin was doing. They knew that it was related. They may not know the particulars, and they certainly knew that it was not like their local expression modality. But the fact that there's improvising in it, they could definitely hear that. They definitely knew something about the rhythmic approach. We're, we're not playing Kosa or Bikutsi or some other specific African continental grooves or forms, but they knew that it was related. And that's a bit different. I've played also a little bit on another State Department trips in parts of Asia, of South Asia, you know, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Occasionally in some of those concerts, there were audiences that you could tell had never seen or heard jazz. I think they appreciated aspects of the music, but you could also tell that there were elements that were quite foreign to them. We're not playing sitar, not playing tabla. The fact that these groups didn't have any percussion. I'm thinking of the one trio that I was in. I was playing a bass guitar with the flutist Jamie Baum and the guitarist Kenny Wessel. And we're playing a bunch of pieces associated with Louis Armstrong, but there was no drums. So I think people found that interesting. If they're used to hearing, you know, Redungum or Dolak or other drums that are used in Indian music. So I think they were maybe a little bit surprised by that. In your essay, Jazz on the Global State, you give an insider's view of the history and implication of the flourishing of jazz in locales far from the African-American birthplace here in the United States. And I just want to read something that's really a paraphrasing of obviously longer work. Jazz has, throughout its history, held appeal for people from many different societies and from different places within society, including at its margins. It is rooted in and is a manifestation of the human ability to redefine marginality as a location of radical openness and possibility. The trends national existence of jazz may be evidence that many other groups now share with black folks a sense of deep alienation, despair, uncertainty, loss of a sense of grounding. To the extent that this is true, the shared sensibilities which cross the boundaries of class, gender, race, etc. may represent a threat to those who view jazz as an exclusively African-American art form. So what's going on here? Is music more a marker of cultural identity to be owned and protected? Or is it a salve of inclusivity? It's such a paradox. <laughs> I guess the answer to that is it depends upon the person. There, there are people whose approach to music that came out of their culture or their subculture is this is our music. I think that's a normal human um, thing to feel emotional attachment to something that came from your culture. So, you know, this is ours. Now, is that 
sense of ours exclusive? Is it excluding other people, other groups? Various examples to think of come to mind. Hip hop came out of South Bronx, mainly people of color, black folks, Latino folks. But it spread around the world, and it certainly spread with, throughout the U.S. And, you know, Eminem emerged, and folks in the hip-hop community, you know, I'm sure there were some people who said, you know, man, what's this white boy doing? But other folks were like, look, I like it. I like it. And, you know, he's cool with me. My sense, and I'm not a big hip-hop scholar or audience member, but my sense is that he was very much embraced by the world of hip hop, you know? So there is some inclusivity working there. There's been in the jazz world, and certainly in the jazz education world, I haven't been following this closely, but black folks are a minority in the U.S. population. And Jazz was developed, emerged from the African-American community. As it entered the, you know, university world, you know, as it became less a music that you had to learn in the clubs and just getting together with people and transmitted that way to where it became something that you could study in schools in colleges, music programs, and conservatories, there wound up being some concern among African-American jazz musicians that aspects of the music that seemed important to the music couldn't really be transmitted or weren't being transmitted in the academic environment. You're not playing for dancers, you know, in a music program in college and I've been in situation where you know there were certain jazz clubs where you know some folks would get up and dance and of course the genres of music that are components of jazz certainly include dance music and there's a time of course the heyday of big bands in the 30s and 40s where it was really a popular music for dancing that you don't get in a conservatory program. And aspects of the blues aesthetic often don't get effective attention in college jazz programs. So there were some people who were really concerned about that. So this is the way that we grew up and learned this music, the way that we learned our music. The music is now being transmitted to younger generations in ways that don't carry aspects that we consider important to our music. What does that mean for the future development of the music? So this is another aspect where some people feel like, oh, they're playing that college jazz. It's not the real thing. And of course, as jazz has spread around the planet, you have largely freestanding jazz cultures. This is a lot of what I was trying to write about in that essay. That you know, you have jazz in Cologne, Germany, and in Amsterdam, Netherlands, and in Tokyo, Japan, and in Paris, France, and in Oslo, Norway. You have musicians. You have record labels, you have audiences, you have clubs, you have writers. You have all these things that are part of, and you have teaching, you have jazz programs in schools and stuff. All these elements, I mean, certainly the music is not being transmitted to younger generations and not being presented to audiences in the same way that it was in clubs, you know, in 52nd Street in New York in the 40s and 50s or, you know, in Baker's Keyboard Lounge in Detroit. It's different. And so people start playing the music in their own way. They always play it in their own way. And their ways arguably take on or are shaped by the environments these particular 
cultures. What does that do for people who feel like the music is ours? Is the music now the world's? The role of the origin culture, I think, is always noted and respected and has meaning. And the music has flown the coop and people have taken it and done what they do with it. The whole South African take on jazz is identifiable. It's got its own flavor. You know what Hugh Masekela did. And it's different than what Jan Garbarek and Harold Anderson and folks in Norway and Sweden, a lot of that stuff was documented, you know, on the ECM label, which had a particular flavor. And it's different from the Blue Note labels, artists and flavor, and even the sound of the recording, because Rudy Van Gelder was a different engineer than the folks at Talent Studio in Oslo. So all of this stuff is of interest to me. You know, so jazz is, there is the marker of cultural identity aspect to it. But because you're dealing with individuals and a variety of locales, the cultural identity exists alongside personal identity and subcultural regional identity and personally i think that jazz is an african-american birthed art form that is not and you could say maybe arguably has never been exclusively african-american in terms of the practitioners and the audiences and so now it is really very much a global art form with African-American roots. So you didn't start out as a professional musician per se. You went to Harvard for degrees in social relationships and psychology. Are you aware of these areas of thought influencing your work as an artist? It certainly has influenced me as a person and therefore me as a music maker. I'm aware of the social context of music. Music as a social pursuit, something that all cultures have their musics. So I'm aware of that. I'm aware of me as a person as a artist moving through and presenting music in a variety of social spaces and I'm aware of those spaces their class aspects and their ethnic aspects and their age and gender aspects and all of that stuff I'm observing as I move through I'm often wondering how the people who see me, what they're thinking and what their awareness of the social dimensions are. I play at some university club in, in Manhattan and yeah, okay, yeah, I went to an Ivy League school. I know a little bit about the history of these spaces and who tends to be in them and not to stereotype because there's change and variety and all of that. That's different than playing at the Village Vanguard. I'm aware of the variety and differing dynamics sometimes that happen between people in these different social contexts. And I'm aware of music. Yo, Bach, oh, I'm working on this cantata for the next church service or you read about Mozart and some letters you know about how he was being treated by patrons or I think about seeing some video of Howlin' Wolf being filmed in some club in Chicago 
working class folks got off the assembly line, you know, hear some music and shake it around a little bit. These distinctions and commonalities, I, I maintain some awareness of that stuff. And if I'm writing something, I have some awareness of, okay, I've got this particular tune, this particular piece kind of came out of some rather abstract interests that I have about harmony or melody construction. But this other piece, I want it to have some resonances of, can I find a way to bring some these aspects of this Arabic music that I've been studying in a back burner way, can I bring that into this arrangement of, you know, the spiritual go down Moses? I did a setting of that tune for Abraham Inc., this Klezmer funk hip hop band that I'm in. It's one of the projects that David Krakauer co-leads. And I try to be aware of the resonances of these social contexts and associations that are part of music. And I try to bring that awareness to my playing and writing, and I'm certainly aware of it as I get to play in different situations. You've covered so much ground in your career talking to young people. What personal characteristics are crucial for an individual who chooses to be a professional musician? I asked that question, and in the back of my head, I'm also thinking, so what do you see as the difference between the classical musician and the jazz musician? These days, I have a sense that perhaps the distinctions are not as different as they used to be, perhaps. Okay, jazz musicians continue to work in less institutional contexts. The funding for keeping classical music afloat is more institutionally oriented, more grant and maybe large donor, you know, you know, there's all of that going on. There's, there is a certain amount of that in the jazz world, but there's less of it. In terms of what I think might be crucial for individuals, being entrepreneurial seems to be more and more necessary, I would say, for monetary survival than it used to be. I came up in a time when, okay, while I'm trying to get my jazz career established, I could play weddings and parties and stuff. And a lot of that work has vanished with the rise of the DJ. So what I see, at least like looking through the pages of chamber music America's magazine and observing on the New York City scene, I certainly see a bunch of chamber groups that are really trying to reach audiences that are not like necessarily the traditional classical music audiences, and they're trying to reach them in ways that are not the older ways. And they're really attending to marketing themselves more than those groups used to decades ago. And I think it's because they have to in order to find opportunities to play and to get paid. And I see the same attitude among a lot of jazz players. No one's going to hand stuff to you. You got to really be a warrior and a searcher and go out there and do it. And you better have your social media outreach together and I mean I'm trying to take heed and learn from all of that and incorporate that even though I'm arguably somewhat established that part of the music business environment has changed and my sense talking to younger folks is that because they've come along as this change has happened so they're 
yeah, we got it going. You know, we're, we're trying to really work it. And, and my sense is that younger classical musicians are just as aware of those dynamics as jazz and non-jazz, non-classical musicians are. When you look back on the thousands of performances you've done um, over the years, is there one that stands out that you just remember? Oh, boy. There are a bunch. There's one in particular. I played with Sonny Rollins for 13 years, you know, seven years playing bass guitar and six years playing guitar. I think I was playing bass guitar. We were in Austin, Texas at a venue called Armadillo World Headquarters. I'm pretty sure it hasn't existed for quite a while. It was like a large sort of Quonset hut building and a raised stage and then there's the audience seating area and we were playing our usual set which varied from gig to gig so they would call different tunes and we were playing i think I'm pretty sure it was the very thought of you as a ballad and folks are listening and we're playing and you know it's all cool and we're approaching the end between the edge of the stage and where the seating started, there was a open area. So we're approaching the end of the tune when all of a sudden a number of couples got up and went to that area. And then I realized that's the dancing area. You know, it hadn't occurred to me. And they started dancing. Sunny motion, keep it going. And he dug deep into his Coleman Hawkins bag and phrasing and tone. Wow. I mean, I'll never forget it. It was like all of a sudden we could have been back in like 1938 or something playing for dancers deep in that vibe. And I was like, oh my God. Sonny always sounded great, but it's like he just opened a door and went there for a while, you know, for another like four or five minutes or something, you know, and a few choruses of this ballad. And it's like so expressive and, you know, it's floating there. And then the tune ended and I was just floored. We'll never forget that. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, that was deep. That was way deep. Jerome, if you had the opportunity to talk to your 20-year-old self and you were tasked with giving that person some advice, could you think of what that would be? Oh, wow. I'm trying to remember really where my head was at when I was 20. Goodness. I don't know how useful this advice would be, and I think it would have been maybe obvious. I guess I'm thinking almost more about things that I regret that I didn't do, but a lot of people do these things, I'm just observing. I was one of these people who looked down, I don't know, snobbishly or something at guitar players who were like all about chops, all about, you know, certain raw technique I don't know somehow I was vibing more on Jim Hall and certainly love Wes Montgomery and respected guitar players with a lot of technique Wes had tons of technique and a very particular personal type and George Benson but maybe I would have said don't sneer at that stuff because it doesn't have to be a trap you can attend to I was self-taught up until literally the summer before I started at Newton Conservatory. And so I had a lot of bad, ineffective technical habits and a lot of stuff to learn in general. So it wasn't like I was not trying to improve my technique on my instruments. But I might have leaned a little harder, you know, if someone had advised me and say, yeah, don't, don't neglect that stuff. Just do it. Try to use it wisely aesthetically but don't sneer at it and i think for someone who is kind of retiring or shy find ways 
that you can tolerate to toot your own horn loudly because the way the music and the entertainment industrial complex is developing, it's getting harder to carve out a niche and find a public that will support you financially in what you're doing. So you better find some way to cope with that. That would have been good advice for me. Well, you've done pretty well. Luckily, a lot of work and luck, yeah. Jerome, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I really appreciate you coming on the show and discussing all this. Just a pleasure. Thank you so well, much. Thank you. This has been fun. It's been fun. It has been fun. And I hope we find cause to do it again. Maybe we'll even be on the same stage at some point. I hope so. Take good care. Yeah, you too, Bob. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Where the Twain Meet. And please check out future programming at our website, wherethetwainmeet.com. <laughs>